What is the gospel? They say it's good news. But why? It seems as though it is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and we keep beating ourselves up for not being able to obey them all. No, the gospel can't be law. The gospel has to do with death, but the death of sin, so that we can truly live. The gospel isn't a one-time thing. It is a journey, a journey through every area of life, journey through our ups and downs, a journey through trials and triumphs, a journey to the Father's kingdom, a journey that needs to be rediscovered. Well, again, uh, good morning. We're so, so happy uh, to be here with you guys. I love Sunday mornings. I love Sunday mornings for this reason, that we get to get, get together Worship his name, praise him together as a family. Do do we mind raising the house lights? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I know what you guys are thinking. You think I look fantastic for just having a baby, right? (laughs) I know. It's amazing. There's evidently this thing called dad bod. And I have this dad bod, apparently, and apparently I've had it for several years. I didn't realize that. Um, But now I'm officially growing into my body which is that, that's good. Um, I'm now a father. For those of you guys who don't know, I'm sure you do, because either me or my dad mention it about every 15 seconds. So um, I have a new baby girl. She's absolutely beautiful. Sophia, here's a picture of her. Look how beautiful she is. I know, right? She is so attractive, mostly because she looks a lot like me. But, um, but there's pieces of April in there too. Um, we're, we're just, we are so in love with her. Um, she is a party animal. She likes to be partying all night long. Um, so our nightlife has increased dramatically since we've had a baby. So the sermon may be very, very short so that I can go take a nap. We actually have, we actually have a Sunday afternoon tradition now. It's fantastic. You know, a lot of you guys maybe get together with family and watch football. That's fantastic. We used to do that. Now we go over to grandma and grandpa's to sleep. Um, and it's great. So everybody wins, Sophia gets spoiled, grandma and grandpa get to love and love and love on little Sophia, and they do. My word, whenever we walk through the door of their house, we don't exist anymore. I used to, I used to be a mama's boy, you guys probably know that, I used to be a mama's boy. Um, so I used to walk in and my mom, oh Mark, we're so happy you're here, give me a hug. Now it's, oh Sophia! <laughs> so but it it is a joy. We are learning as we go. Um, I could write a book on how to raise a child in the first two weeks. Um, I don't know how any of my methods would turn out, but (laughs) I could give you instructions for the first two weeks. They would probably turn out horrible. Ask me in 18 years. All right, maybe I'll write another book, but it has been so much fun. I'm so excited that we have some of our athletes here in the class of 86. This is so cool. HCS is such an important, important part of HCC Hollywood Community Church. It's, it's a ministry that we love and we are so proud of the school. We're so proud of what Dr. Hill is doing in the lives of the students and, and our alumni when they come back. It is just so awesome uh, to see and witness what God's doing here at Hollywood Christian School. It is a joy. This morning we are going to be continuing our series of rediscovering the gospel. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. You can go ahead and turn there. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Philippians 4, starting in verse 4. This series is called Rediscovering the Gospel, and we've talked over and over and over again about how the gospel is more than just a one-time thing. The gospel isn't just it happened and it's over, but rather the gospel is a journey. That's the video we show you guys every week. We want you guys to understand that concept. The gospel is a journey through life. Every aspect of life is part of the gospel, and the gospel transforms that. And we will get there towards the end of today's sermon. But again, we are in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. If you're there, you can follow along as I read. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And jump down to verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. That now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your incredible words of encouragement this morning. This passage here in Philippians has so much depth, and I'm so eager to dive into it and see what you have in store for us this morning. Father, I I, I beg that you be with me, that you bless my words, that that, that your thoughts and your words are my words and my thoughts, that you allow Mark to get out of the way and for your message to be communicated clearly. Father, allow my, my faults and my failures not to corrupt your message this morning. We love you. We praise you. We surrender ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I desperately need my iPhone. I just, I absolutely need my iPhone, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry for all your um, Androidites or Samsungites, I don't know what you guys are, I don't know what we are, we just love our iPhones, Um, but I'm sorry for all you guys, maybe the one person that still likes their Blackberry, I'm sorry, Um, but, but I need my iPhone, and I know what you're thinking, oh, those millennials. You have not seen my father in a meeting. (laughs) My dad desperately needs his iPhone as well. I need this. It does so much for me. It can do whatever I want. Any need that I have, I just pull this thing out, whip it out, and guess what? There's an app for that. I need my iPhone. I need it. There was another, there was was the other day, this is true, I don't know why. Uh, There was the other day that I had a pencil, and I wanted to measure it. I don't know why, but I just wanted to know how long the pencil was. There's an app for that. There's a ruler app, and I figured out that the pencil was five inches long. In case you were wondering, all right? There's an app for that. It's a rule. This thing can do anything. Any need we have, the iPhone was created. I'm using my iPhone 6 for a reason, because if I use the iPhone 7, I can't listen to music really off of it, because there's no headphone jack, unfortunately. But the iPhone 6 Plus, you can use for anything. It fulfills any of your needs. Think about it. It's a phone. It's an email device, a messenger, an alarm clock, a calculator, a stereo, a camera, a planner, a TV, a computer, a GPS. You can even buy your groceries on this thing. It can fulfill all of your needs. Any need you have, it can do. There's this app that I found this, this past week that um, fulfilled one of April's needs, and she was super excited about it. Um, it's called Run and Pee. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's for those individuals who are sitting in a movie theater and have um, a, a bladder enlargement and have a need to go to the restroom. This app tells you the best point in the movie to run and pee. <laughs> Useful. I know all of you guys are going to go download it now because it is awesome. It is absolutely awesome. Absolutely. The iPhone fulfills our every need. It was one time that April and I were um, out in a field somewhere. It's a beautiful picture. We were just out, um, we were out jogging in a field, I guess. And we were out in a field, and I was getting very warm, obviously. Um, and I was really hot, and I was like, man, the one thing that the iPhone needs is it just needs to, like, have a fan. Like, I could say just, like, go-go gadget fan, and a fan would pop out. I'm like, man, that would be so cool. And then I was at Walgreens and saw this. It's a fan. <laughs> the plugs in to your iPhone. It fulfills all of your needs. This thing is absolutely incredible. And just like my iPhone fulfills so many of my needs, and it does, it fulfills so many of my needs during this week, I have such great, such more drastic, such severe spiritual needs that my iPhone obviously can't satisfy. But we see in Scripture that there is a fulfillment for our needs. 
See, this is what Paul is talking about in today's passage in Philippians chapter 4. He's saying there is, a, there is a fulfillment to your needs. God provides your needs. He goes through and he lists several things that God is providing our needs in. He gives several examples of things that he provides that we're going to look at this morning. First, we see that God provides contentment. This passage, as we were reading through it, I hope that you were encouraged by all of the language of contentment. That's the purpose. You see, contentment is something that we all long for. I know people probably say this all the time, um, but, but I didn't really understand contentment until I had a child. I didn't, I didn't fully understand what that word contentment was until I had a child, and, and there was a time where she was fussing and crying, and I just went over, and I picked her up, and it was such a beautiful moment, and we made eye contact, and immediately, her diaper was filled with gusto. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately, her bowels were empty, and my arm was warm, and... The face that she made was pure contentment. It was something like this face. You can see pure, <laughs> pure contentment. You see, it's that contentment that we long for. Am I right? Maybe not that one exactly. Well, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it's contentment that we long for. And Paul tells the church of Philippi, Philippi that their contentment or their joy isn't based on just their circumstances. See, joy is not based on our circumstances. If joy was based on our circumstances, then we could not be content in every situation. But Paul in this passage is telling us to be content no matter our circumstances. Again, this is the book of Philippians written to the church in Philippi. Paul's writing this in the midst of intense struggles. The church in Philippi is experiencing intense persecution. They're going through some serious hard times. Their life is very, very difficult. And in the midst of that, Paul is saying, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. See, the Philippians, the Philippians had every right to be upset with this admonition. They had every right to be upset. How dare you tell me to rejoice? Do you know my life? Do you know the family members that I've lost? And you're telling me to rejoice? How often do we do that in our lives? in the midst of incredible pain, in the midst of discomfort, in the midst of loss, we get angry and say, how dare you think that I should be happy? How dare you think that I should have this joy and contentment? But Paul is saying rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. You see, this admonition, it carries weight because of the, math, the mouthpiece. Paul is the one who is telling the people in Philippi, to rejoice, and we, we see that Paul has a resume that is not easily matched. We get a glimpse of it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 24 through 28. It's not on the slides, but I'll read it. Please follow along. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in the toil and a hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from the other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. You see, the mouthpiece, the person that is saying rejoice and again rejoice, has perfect reason not to rejoice. But he, in the midst of his situation, ad admonishes the church in Philippi, admonishes us to rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. You see, our joy cannot be determined by our circumstances. In the midst of whatever we're going through, contentment is still possible. Joy is still feasible. Despite our circumstances, we truly can be content. Many of you know uh, Tim Elton. He's a member of our church 
he graduated from Hollywood Christian School, played football on the, on the football team while he was here. Um, there he is. Tim Elton is, is a dear, dear friend of mine and a dear, dear brother and part of this con- uh, congregation. Tim Elton is the perfect example of this point, being content despite our circumstances. I had him send me an outline, a list, like Paul does in his passage of things that he's experienced. In 2009, Tim was diagnosed with stomach cancer. His stomach, his gallbladder, and spleen were all removed, and then a new stomach was made out of his small intestines. He was 290 pounds, dropped down to 104 pounds. He had several operations for hernias and basic scar cleanup. Anytime you use the word basic when it's scar cleanup, you know that it's probably not good. After that, he got pneumonia, and he spent eight weeks in a coma. His left lung collapsed as well. When he came out of a coma, he spent five weeks in rehab. About a year later, if that wasn't enough, he got in a motorcycle accident and crushed his left knee. The surgeon was able to save his leg, but he has a metal knee now, and he's lost so much weight, and he's become so frail that you can see the screws in his knee. After all of that, he spent the last three years passing out, being unable to gain and maintain weight. And now he's going in for another surgery. Has he had the surgery yet, Linda? No. He's going in for another surgery for more cleanup and to have a feeding tube placed in. The reason he's in the hospital now is because he had a pick line put in and he developed a very strong blood infection. You see, if it was logical, Tim should have passed away several, several times. He's gone through the most difficult situations. He's gone through the pain. He's gone through the hardships. He's lost the family and the friends. He's experienced that hurt. But if you guys know Tim, he is the first one to say a joke and to be smiling. He's the first one to experience this joy. He sent me this message. He said, it's been a long, long seven years. And although it's been rough, I can look back and see God working in my life and others around me. How do you have that perspective? In the midst of that pain, in the midst of that hardship, to be able to say that, to be able to experience this contentment, he's content despite his circumstances. You see, your contentment is not a result of your circumstances, but your contentment is a result of prayer. Contentment is a result of prayer. There in verse 6 and 8, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In the midst of our circumstances, in the midst of our pain, we have this tendency to focus on ourselves. We have this tendency to focus on our hurt, on our struggles, on our pain, on our loss. We have this tendency to focus on how bad our situation is. Augustine, the great theologian, calls this homo incurvatus. And it's this idea of being curved in on oneself. He, he, he describes this as the posture of sin. This idea that we are so curved in on ourselves that our only focus is ourself. Our only focus is our pain. Our only focus is our struggles, our life, the pain we're going through. And when we have that perspective, yes, contentment isn't possible in the midst of pain. But Paul tells us in this passage that that isn't our posture. That ought not be our posture, but rather our posture ought to be one of prayer and surrender. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. See, instead of focusing on ourselves, instead of focusing on our own pain, when our eyes look up to him, when we surrender our lives to him, when we give our pain to him, then there is peace. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See, contentment isn't based on our circumstances. Contentment isn't based on our circumstances. If our focus is truly on God, if we are surrendering our pain and our hurt to God, then our contentment is not based on our circumstances. Our focus cannot be ourselves. My question is, are you surrendering your struggles to God? If you are so focused on your pain and your hurt, and trust me, I know there is pain and hurt in this room. I know there is deep grief, and I know there is great joy, because FSU lost yesterday. So I know there are people that are very upset, and I know there are people that are very happy, all right? But I know you guys are experiencing intense pain. Are you focusing on yourself? Are you focusing on your own pain? Or are you surrendering your struggles to God? Don't be curved in on yourself. Not only in this passage do we see that God provides us with contentment, but we see that he provides us with strength. God provides strength. Let's look at one of the most well-known and probably most tattooed verses in Scripture, Philippians 4, chapter 13. Philippians 4, chapter 13. Can we put it on the screens? I want everyone to read it with me. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ, or Him, who strengthens me. Say it again. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. See, this is a very powerful verse, and rightly a very popular verse. This is a verse that provides such incredible encouragement in the time of pain and the time of hurt as the church in Philippi was experiencing. Paul says that he can do all things through Christ. We understand that the strength in which God provides us is limitless. His strength is limitless limitless. It is this limitless strength that he gives us in the midst of our circumstances. It's this limitless strength that he gives us in the midst of our trials and our tribulations. It's the strength that he gives us when we're weak. A limitless strength. Isaiah 40 verse 29 says, he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. See, when you're in the midst of those hard times and you feel weak and have no strength, he gives you strength. There is no way. We were not created to be able to endure life's hardships on our own strength. We were not created to combat these spiritual downfalls. But rather, we were created to accept the strength of God, a limitless, all-powerful strength from God. If you are relying on your own strength, you will be drained. You will fail. It will end in misery if you rely on your own strength. We must rely on the strength, the limitless strength of God. We see the strength, though, isn't a strength to accomplish just what we want. It is a strength to accomplish his mission. We can accomplish his mission. You see, his strength is for his purpose. It's not to accomplish the things that we desire. It's not to accomplish the things that we want, but rather it is for his purpose, his mission. It's not so that I can run and jump out of a plane without a parachute while screaming, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and then land like a cat that was dropped. That's that's not what this is for. It's not saying that I can go try out so you think you can dance and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because I can do this. You're impressed. You know you are. You know you are. No, that's not what this is saying. It's not a verse to to empower us to accomplish our desires. It's not a verse to empower us to accomplish our feats and the things that we want for our life. No, it is God's strength for God's mission. His strength accomplishes His purpose, not ours. I was talking about my iPhone when we started this morning. 
And our iPhone, if we're using it for, for what it's used for, for, for the needs that I mentioned before, it's fantastic, right? It, it fulfills so many of my needs. If I need to measure a pencil, I can. If I get hot, I can use that fan. Although April said I didn't need it, which I don't understand because large man plus South Florida equals needed iPhone fan. But, 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 but whatever I need, I can do that. But there are certain things that my iPhone cannot accomplish. If, if say, I'm on, say I'm on the work site, I don't know why I would ever be on the work site, that would be one of the most dangerous things in the world, but say I'm on the work site and I'm working with this piece of wood, I can measure the wood with my awesome ruler app on my iPhone, but if I were to try to hammer a nail into that wood with my iPhone, my wife probably would not be very happy with me. Might be the end of my iPhone. Might last for about three nails. Or, or maybe if, if my baby is crying all night long, I don't know why I said if, when my baby is crying all night long, all right, and she needs to be soothed, I can play some wonderful lullaby music on my phone. But I, I should not stick this in her mouth as a pacifier. They say it has more germs than a public toilet seat. I don't know if that's true. But I would not put this in my daughter's mouth. Volleyball players, there's some volleyball players here. If you guys were at practice and didn't have any volleyballs, I wouldn't go, oh, I got an iPhone. Don't worry about it. Take my iPhone. Go spike that. No, because that's not what the iPhone is created for. That's not what my phone is created for. If you take it outside of its mission, it's going to fail. That's not its strengths. In the same way, the strength that we have from God is to accomplish his mission, is to accomplish his purpose. So please, be encouraged by that verse. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, but are you on mission? Are you living a life to glorify God? You see, that, that verse is wonderful, but it's not a verse used to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now I'm going to go win my football game so that I can become all state. No, it's saying God gives me strength so that I can go out and play the best of my ability for his honor and for his glory. Yes, I can do all things through Christ. I can go and I can be confident and do well at my job for his honor and for his glory. To form relationships that others wouldn't be able to form for his name to be proclaimed. You see, he gives us strength to further his kingdom. We can do all things, but through Christ who gives us strength. Paul realized this as he was talking to the Philippians. In the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their pain, he says, I, I know you're struggling. You can be content. Trust me, you can have contentment in the midst of your circumstances. I have gone through pain. You can be content. You can be content because you can do all things. You can experience, you can go through these things for his name, for his honor, and his glory through Christ, because he gives you strength. So we see that God gives us contentment. We see that he gives us strength. But if this is our only understanding, that we can be content and be strong, then this is no more than a motivational speech. You see, our contentment and our strength is something that is given from a father to his child. It is something that we receive in our union with Christ. It extends so far past uh, I'm sad, make me happy, or I'm tired, make me strong. It extends into our intimate relationship with the creator of the world, into our intimate relationship with Christ. It is in our union that his strength becomes our strength. It is in our union with Christ that his joy becomes our joy. God provides salvation. God provides salvation. Um, I'm going to flip to another passage, Ephesians. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. If you can turn there with me, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You very well may know these verses. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Let me read that again. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one can boast. You see, God provides for our greatest need. No matter how much we have or no matter how much we don't have, no matter the amount of abundance we live in, we still all have the same need. We must recognize our greatest need need. We've shown this video before, uh, but I'd like to show it again because I think it brings home this point. Um, it, it's an interview that 60 Minutes with, did with Tom Brady several, several years ago. And you'll see his response, but recognize the importance of all of us recognizing our great need. Tom Brady, the quarterback of the New England Patriots, is not only one of the NFL's best players, he's one of the NFL's great stories. At the tender age of 30, he has already won three Super Bowls, an accomplishment that ranks him with some of the best quarterbacks ever to play the game. And he's having one of the greatest seasons in pro football history. When we first reported on him back in 2005, he seemed underrated and almost overlooked. He doesn't have the arm of Peyton Manning, and he doesn't have tattoos, and he doesn't take steroids, and he's never held out for more money. All he knows how to do is win. <laughs> it's what you always wanted. <laughs> You're right. You're right. It has. And I didn't think it came with all the other baggage, though. In addition to his success on the field and his sex appeal off it, there is also the $60 million 10-year contract to play with the Patriots. I mean, I'm making more money now than I ever thought I could ever make playing football. <laughs> But with all that money, fame, and career accomplishments, we were surprised to hear this from him. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and, and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life is me. I thank God. It's got to be more than this. What's the answer? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. The answer is our union with Christ. You see, it's in our relationship with Christ that we experience the contentment. You see from that interview that contentment is not based on our circumstances. No matter how much we have, we can still be absent of joy because joy does not come from possessions. Joy comes from Christ. Joy comes from our union with the Creator. The Creator of joy, the creator of contentment, gives those things to us in his intimate relationship. You see, our actions cannot save us. What we have cannot save us. Our name, our resume cannot save us. We have a great, deep need. We have a serious, severe need need. Paul talks to the church of Rome on a very lengthy basis about this, reminding them that, that they are all sinners, that we are all sinners, that there is no one that is righteous, and it is righteousness alone that allows us into the kingdom. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, you and I, despite your circumstances at home, Despite your financial situation, we have the same need. We have a deep, a severe need. A need for life. A need for salvation. We cannot take credit for the life that he gives us. We see that our actions cannot save us. Because salvation and life comes purely through the blood of Christ. There's a thinking going around that when we die, we'll come before the gates of heaven and there will be this magical scale there and we'll weigh our good and our bad. And if we've done more good things than our bad things, then we are all clear. Scripture can't condemn that thinking enough. You see, the kingdom, our God, is, is, is a God of perfection, a place of perfection, and to be a part of his kingdom Perfection is all that is allowed. 
So anything short of complete righteousness cannot be part of his kingdom. No matter if we've done more good than bad. The only way that we can be a part of his family, that we can be adopted as his children, is based purely on the blood of Christ. We do not have life apart from Christ. I've had the privilege, see if I can get, this without, get, out, get through this without being emotional. I've had the privilege of living with one of the clearest pictures of the gospel. Many of you know my sister Amber and the struggles that she faces. Amber was born with severe cerebral palsy. She's mentally a two-month-old. She can't see, hard of hearing, can't walk, can't take care of herself, can't communicate. She is de- entirely dependent on another. By herself, there's no way that she could have life. In and of her, her own abilities, there's no way that she could survive. No no matter how good of a day, no matter how joyful she may be on a certain day, by by herself, there is no life. But my mom, my mom has sacrificed her life to give life to my sister. See, Amber, in the midst of her pain, in the midst of her hardships, in the midst of her brokenness, doesn't have life, but now she experiences life. She's a part of a beautiful body of Christ. Why? Because my mom has sacrificed. My mom has sacrificed her time, her passions. She's given up her life so that my sister could have life. I've had the privilege of living with this image of the gospel. It has transformed my way of thinking because I realize that me, by myself, I have no life. That based on my own actions, no matter how great of a day I might have, there's no way that I have life by myself. But there is a righteous, holy, just God who loved me so much that he gave his son for me and his son sacrificed his life so that I could have life. We have life not based on ourselves at all. We have life based on Christ. Our actions cannot save us, but the gospel that saves us is not simply a one-time thing as we talked about. It's not just simply a one-time salvation. That's not the gospel that we preach. That's not the gospel that we hold to. Yes, we believe that God saves us and that the gospel saves us, but we also know that the gospel restores every aspect of life. The gospel restores every aspect of life. Again, we talked at the beginning about the gospel being a journey, a journey through life's ups and downs. And that's what today's passage is. That's what today's passage is talking about. It's saying in the midst of life's ups and downs, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your hurt, the gospel is present. How can you be content? How can you have joy? How can you have this strength in the midst of your pain? You can because of the gospel. Because Christ came to earth, sacrificed himself, not just for you to have eternal life, but now for you to live in him, for you to live with contentment, for you to live with strength to accomplish his mission and his purpose. See, the gospel restores every aspect of our life, whether it's our marriage, our relationships, our joy, our work, whatever it is, the gospel restores life. In, um, early in the passage, Paul says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. That word learned, it's in the aorist form, which is incredibly crucial to understanding this passage. Oftentimes when we think of, of, of learning, we think of a gradual process. Eventually in my life, I finally understood to be content. But the aorist form doesn't communicate that at all. The aorist form communicates a one-time event with no previous action, no future action. It is the aorist tense. I learned at one point in my life, I finally understood this. I got this. And it wasn't based on Paul's action 
at all. See, just like Paul, if we've had that point in our life where we've, we've become united with Christ, then we truly can be content. In our union with Christ, we can, we can be content. We can face the struggles of life. We have that limitless strength. In Christ, our needs are satisfied. But we have to recognize our need. So many of us, I'm guilty of this as well, go through life convincing ourselves that I can take care of this situation. That in the midst of pain, it's just because I haven't figured it out yet. In the midst of hurt, it's just because I I haven't handled it the right way. Next time, I'll do better. We fail to recognize our desperate need for more. Our desperate need for more. We have a huge cavity in our heart. Our lives in, in no way get us into the kingdom. It is a great need that we have, and if you have yet to surrender your life to Christ so that he can fulfill that need of life, I am begging you to do that this morning. I am begging you to start this union, this relationship with Christ, this journey, this journey of restoration, this gospel journey, where you finally will be able to experience contentment and joy and peace in the midst of struggles. If you're on the journey right now and you're in an intimate relationship with Christ and you're still experiencing that pain, it's a constant battle we're going to face. But we have to focus on Christ. We have to surrender our problems to Christ through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in our hearts If we take our petitions to the Lord, he's going to give us a peace, a peace that is so far being able to understand, a strength that is limitless, a life in him.